Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Higg reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of videos on the philosophy of Jürgen Habermas by moving on today to discuss the structural transformation of the public sphere, Chapter 3. Now, if you've not seen a video 1, which covers Chapters 1 and 2 of this book, as well as the three videos I did on his uh, theory of communicative action, I'd recommend you to check those out for a more general overview of his theory of communicative rationality. In this video, we'll just go ahead and move on with this particular book. Now, if you enjoyed this discussion, you might be interested in my upcoming book, The Later Philosophy of Penti Linkola, in which I explain Linkola's notorious rejection of democratic political procedures by contrasting him with Habermas. Habermas, of course, believed that people can communicate their way to solutions. Linkola believes that language and the elasticity of language, which ecological law lacks, is precisely the source of the problem. Uh, Habermas believed that communication is with the requirement to be accountable to uh, scientific objectivity, etc. Linkola believes that uh, communication is maybe inherently pathological. It's something which you cannot trust um, not to violate uh, things like ecological principles if it's convenient, if there's an interest, especially on the part of people, to do things like make profit, etc. Um, so it's very important debate, which there's much more to be said about it than that, but it's something which will have to be deferred to um, this 250-plus uh, page book I will be releasing on Amazon by early March of the present year, 2020, this video will just go ahead and move on with Habermas's uh, position as such. In uh, Chapter 3, Political Functions of the Public Sphere, Habermas opens by mentioning that in 18th century Britain, you see the rise of a properly political public sphere, rather than one which merely focused on, say, letting people discuss literary texts and, and things like that that you found in earlier times. In this case, the public also was something which people realized they could appeal to in order to legitimate demands before the public, for example, in the conflict between finance and manufacturing, both sides tried to appeal to the public to plead their case for legitimacy and get uh, a competitive advantage over the other side. One unexpected consequence of this parliamentization of state authority you see in this century was the emergence of the public itself as an organ which could be used in the service of the state. This was pretty strange in that as early as the 1670s, coffee houses were seen as seedbeds of political unrest against which the government actually felt the need to issue proclamations. Habermas recounts a certain political shift in which um, when Daniel Defoe, for example, defended the Whigs in writing, um, this is something which Habermas sees as maybe the first time that party spirit was made public spirit, uh, public spirit in this type of communicative way. Yet this merely prefigured a certain inevitable trend because newspapers form the public opinion. They can be mobilized for properly political uses. This becomes a much bigger problem, obviously, in our era. Um, but it's something which you find um, a, a type of rationalization for something like that in that in, um, in this era, a minority who cannot get their way within parliament for numerical reasons could just seek refuge in the public sphere. They could appeal to the judgment of the public to boost their standing in a way which would otherwise seem inaccessible. This conflict between political institution and public would also lead to a tendency to contrast the official election results with the sense of the people on grounds the two did not perf perfectly overlap. For example, Fox News and, uh, say, talk radio uh, maybe 10 years ago would, co would constantly contrast, you know, the American people with bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., not without cause. Um, and this is something that you see even more um, explicitly in the 2016 election in which it was actually both Trump and Clinton found themselves contrasting what did the will of the people really say versus what were the official results. You find, um, for example, Hillary Clinton saying that she had won the popular vote. And on the other hand, you had a petition after Trump's election to um, force electoral college members in states Trump won to vote against their own state's people's wishes simply on grounds that Hillary had won the popular vote and the sense that somebody in Ohio 
should give the state to Clinton simply because there was a majority, most of which was focused, of course, in California, um, in the nation as a whole. There was a conflict, regardless of how you feel about that particular um, election. There was, regardless, a conflict between the will of the people and the official electoral process, which, ironically enough, both of the sides, rather than just it being a conservative or a liberal issue, focused on. So, by 1792, um, this goes beyond mere rhetoric. This is the first time that public opinion was formally invoked within Parliament. This was quite a shift, as earlier references to the vulgar opinion, as it was once called, are suddenly cast in a new light. Now it's public opinion. Uh, France also saw something of a rise in public sphere, as um, you have in um, the 18th century, for example, newspapers, which uh, uh, one of them got like 1,600 subscribers, which was um, at that time a lot of subscribers. And by the way, YouTubers, if you have like, say, a couple thousand subscribers, it might maybe not seem you know, huge compared to someone like, I don't know, PewDiePie or somebody like that. But um, keep in mind, that's intrinsically a lot of people. Like we we have this illusion on uh, YouTube with like Demi Lovato getting like 2 billion views off one music video or, or things like that. Um, comparable musicians like Justin Bieber doing doing the same thing. Um, we have this illusion that like thousands of people tuning in is, is, is not significant, but it really is. That's intrinsically a lot of people. And we have this debate whether um, public sphere on YouTube is a legitimate thing. You can leave a comment on this video w uh, with regard to whether we have something like a, a reenactment of the ideal public sphere right here on YouTube with vloggers, at least for the moment before a, a shift within the YouTube model inevitably occurs. But at any rate, um, you have this conflict, nonetheless, in France in the 18th century, in which although you have this rise of something like a public sphere in terms of journalism, you still have the king exercise a monopoly over public authority nonetheless. It was only later, actually, that politics became an explicit concern within French philosophy. But of course, by the end of the 18th century, there was a remarkable shift in France in that public communication was formally proclaimed to be a basic human right. This was consistent, actually, with a general change in how persons were recognized as the general status of all legal subjects was no longer defined by estate and birth as it formerly was. Rather, increasingly, the, by the public use of reason and communication. This is something which Julius Evola, of course, laments as the uh, deterioration of modernity, um, in which this, he claims, is precisely the truth of democracy as the idea that we're all the same. And a disregard of formerly important things like caste. Now, that is, of course, controversial, but it is something which shows you the difference between the democratic spirit, which, of course, Habermas is interested in here, versus these alternative ways of thinking of things. Therefore, overall, the 18th century was characterized by this shift from natural law to positive law. And one sign of progress in this regard was that a society governed solely by laws of the free market appeared to be one which was freed from the archaic notions of coercion. From this basis, it was generalized that laws of the state should be made like laws of the market, that is to say, equal for all without personal exception. Free market transactions, for example, proceed in accord with calculable expectations in this type of democratization of the process, that is to say, um, quite frankly, anybody who has the money can purchase the product, regardless of who they are. Um, likewise, an ideal of a leg legislative procedure based on rational agreement rather than a battle of political willpower would realize this ideal of reason over coming coercion. Crucially, under this view, we explicitly find that public opinion is not to be understood by older notions of power. That is to say, Power is an archaic view of like the monarchy, the uh, the power of the king. The um, the ideal of public opinion was precisely something different than that, something rooted in rationalization. Ultimately, Habermas claims communicative rationality. At this point, you actually do get basic um, rights meant to guarantee 
the public sphere, as well as its institutions, to guarantee the press, to guarantee party, to guarantee um, assembly, things like that. So in fact, even trials at court were opened up to public attendance for the first time. However, this still left unresolved who exactly the public is. Although by 1804, you see even a Perusian king go as far as to say that publicity is a good for both government and its people, there was something of a split between ideal and reality. One contradiction between um, the two lay in whether the public was a tiny bourgeois minority or whether it included the entire broader rural masses as well. CNN, although they won't explicitly say those words, continue to ask something similar um, when they talk about the American people. Um, there's this sense that the the people in question are um, probably salaried employees um, in uh, uh, coastal enclaves in New York, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, Seattle, uh, Boston, places like that, and the uh, ignorant rural masses spread out in flyover country in between the two coasts. Well, it's debatable whether they're the American people or whether they're included within the public sphere who are here to, you know, um, communicate our way to solutions and <laughs> following electoral procedures. What one actually found in the past also is that the public sphere had certain unspeakable or covert admission requirements, which actually were based on property and education. Um, and these proved that uh, public opinion was not completely ungrounded. There are class interests that make up its true basis. And as controversial as it might be, you find something similar to that now. Um, CNN won't maybe say it in precisely those terms, but there's this sense that um, you're only really in public sphere if if you are, you know, property owner rather than somebody renting an apartment with numerous roommates, let alone living in your car because you can't even afford rent in a place like Denver um, or Los Angeles, etc. So there is the sense that um, the, the, the American people are the homeowner class. Uh, there's also the sense that the American people are the educated class, uh, people with the... Uh, with the good jobs, right? And you have this sense that um, uh, conflicts from the 18th century continue even among the class of thinkers who consider themselves to be fairly open-minded on the topic.